Welcome to Thunderbird Network, where we talk all things Thunderbird. In this episode, we catch up with racehorse trainer Annabelle Nation. Annabelle started on a local pony in her village to becoming one of Australia's leading Group 1 winning trainers. We discuss her transition from eventing to racing and how this has cultivated her approach to racehorse training. Her first runner was a winner and she trained her Group 1 winner in her first nine months of training. She talks us through her experiences so far and what we should expect next. All righty. Um, I'm so excited to introduce Annabelle Nation to the Third Bed Network. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. I, I really appreciate it because, um, well, it's no secret that you're pretty busy um, and you've cemented yourselves in one of the top training ranks that Australia's got to offer. So I really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat to us. No, well, I've probably could have been here a bit sooner if I could have found you and about three <laughs> laps in reverse around. <laughs> that was David's, David's fault. He should have been in charge of that. Um, Annabelle, you've had such a successful year. Um, but can we just, can we just, before we get there, just have a chat about where did the love for horses come from? I think it was probably instilled in me. Both my parents were horsey, albeit they didn't work with horses, but my mum had like ponies growing up and um, my f- father was actually quite horsey um they his family moved to portugal when he was in his teens and they actually moved the horses with them wow um so he show jumped in portugal um and my granny on my father's side of the family she used to point to point so um they didn't have any horses when i was born um but there was a pony in the village and i just i was obsessed with it (laughs) every time we'd take the dogs for a walk i'd have to go and see the pony they'd have to take me to see the pony and um I begged and begged and begged for one. Um, so I got riding lessons instead and then eventually they caved in and they actually leased that pony for me or loaned it. They very kindly in the village let me go and ride it and it sort of basically just spiralled from there. <laughs> that's pretty, um, that's, that's so cute actually to have been able to start from such humble beginnings like that and to and to have just have struck it up on your own accord really. Yeah, well, actually, I even remember opening up, I think it was my eighth birthday, and I remember opening the present up, and it was a little leather bridle, and there was a photo of this chestnut pony called Buttons, which was the pony in the village, and mum said, there you go, it's your pony. I remember it, so however many years ago that was, 22. (laughs) My goodness. Um, And so from then, you sort of... You, that that continued on, really, didn't it? You sort of started to um, compete in sort of different spheres of uh, of equestrian. Yeah, it carried on, and you know, back in England, pony clubs are a really big thing for kids. I think it's probably a lot bigger um, there than it is here. Um, so yeah, I was really into the pony club. The Grafton Pony Club was my local one, and a lot of my school friends had ponies, and um, you go to pony club rallies and competitions, pony club camp where you'd go and stay there for a week with your pony and get up to all sorts. And um, yeah, it just kept spiraling from there. But I was obsessed with it. Um, I'd get up on my own accord, you know, five o'clock in the morning and go and ride my pony before school. And mum very much, you know, said you can only have a pony if you look after it yourself. Um, and she instilled that into me from a very early age so you know it was picking the manure up from the paddock and all of that stuff had to be done otherwise I wasn't allowed a pony so um yeah I think my brothers they rode for about a week and that was it they didn't want to do all the extra stuff (laughs) they wanted the horse tacked up ready to go just get on and off but uh, mum was adamant that if we were going to do it you know you have to do the whole shebang so yeah it was just a bit of an obsession and I think they thought it would wear thin after a while but it only grew it was an expensive hobby. It's not cheap. <laughs> yeah, well, he he was free, that pony. And then my second pony, I think, cost £400. Um, and my parents were probably a bit green as well, I think, um, in knowing what to buy. They bought me – my second pony was a just broken in four-year-old. Oh. Um, that didn't <laughs> like jumping, and I love jumping. And so, yeah, I always had young horses that I had to produce, but I think when I got to, I think I was 14 or 15, they said, that's the last horse we're buying you. Um, bought a horse from Ireland, and they said, that's the last horse. You've got to fund it yourself thereafter. So that's when I started I started buying and selling myself. I'd go over to Ireland with a lady called Serena Russell who used to teach me, and we'd buy Connemara ponies for three or 400 euros, and they were sort of semi-wild, untouched. Um, and, yeah, I'd start by getting commissions off 
off her for producing them. And then, you know, once I'd saved up enough, I started buying and selling my own. And it just, I suppose it, it was probably what funded that last horse my parents bought me actually ended up being um, really my last proper horse. He, t he took me sort of abroad and, um, yeah, we competed international level under 25s and under 21s with him. So, um, that was all funded by this buying and selling on the side. <laughs> what, um, and what discipline did you compete him in? He was in eventing. Um, so dressage, show jumping and, and cross country. I did a, a fair bit of pure show jumping as well, but um, really it was the cross country that I loved. I found the dressage fairly tedious, but it was a <laughs> means to an end and you had to get half good at it if you wanted to win. But yeah, the buzz of the cross country, I think the adrenaline rush um, was, yeah, what what made me choose that. What um and so so what sort of level did you go, did you compete at him to? So we got to two star level, um, which sort of middle, I suppose four stars, the highest. Um, and, we were meant to go to three star, and he did a unfortunately did a tendon just beforehand. There's a there was a eight and nine year old three star event at Blenheim, um, so that was unfortunate. Um, but yeah, he got to a decent level. I think we finished third or fourth in the under twenty fives at, at um, Tattersalls in Ireland. Um, and yeah, he he was just a great horse. It was good fun, and I wasn't going to be good enough to be. Um, you know, William Fox Pitt or any of those people. <laughs> so I think uh, I thought I'd better change discipline and try and do something else that was going to earn a bit more money. Unfortunately, in eventing, you know, it's there's it's very difficult to make a career out of it. Yeah. And so what point did you start having, having a look at racing? So I'd always followed the National Hunt racing. Um, used to go to Cheltenham every year and I used to ride out friends, point-to-pointers. And at one stage I actually did buy a point-to-pointer, but... I think I'd been screwed over. It was it was lame when I got it home and it, it actually had an injury. It was a bit of a disaster. Um, but I yeah, I loved the National Hunt. The flat racing, not so much. I sort of didn't know much about it. And I decided I, I liked the idea of becoming a, a National Hunt trainer. <laughs> and there were a few female trainers, Venetia Williams and Henrietta Knight, to name a few. Um, and I just you know, I love the idea of that, but everybody kept steering me away from it saying it's too hard, you know, unless you're born into racing, it's very difficult and you need a, you know, a lot of financial backing to get started. So, um, I got pushed really into the bloodstock side of it, which I loved as well. I loved going to the sales and I did yearling preps and what have you, but, um, I think ultimately I just decided that it was, I probably missed that hands-on aspect and I missed that adrenaline aspect and being a part of you know it was all very you know well and good looking at yearlings at the sales but I couldn't see myself as actually just buying horses or even selling horses and not being a part of their racing career which was the part that interested me the most. At what point did you start looking at Australia? So Australia um I think I've been here five and a half years. I th and it was a friend of mine, Tom Ward, who used to work for, he came out here and was assistant to John O'Shea when he transitioned to Godolphin. And um, Tom was probably the one that actually that instigated, you know, my interest in flat racing because I lived with him at university and throughout each holiday, he, I'd go off and do bloodstock things, yearling preps and what have you. And he'd go off and work for different trainers around the place. And I just thought it sat, seemed um, more up my alley. So he ended up, getting me a job with Gay Waterhouse. His girlfriend, who's now his wife, Alex Lowe, was working for Gay. Um, so he got me a job with her. And to be honest, I didn't know anything about Australian racing, but I had heard of Gay Waterhouse. She's probably the only trainer I had heard of. <laughs> um, and I'd heard of the Melbourne Cup and the Golden Slipper, and that was about the extent of my racing knowledge. I actually didn't even know whether they raced on dirt or turf, or I knew nothing <laughs> when I came here. So um, it was a real eye-opener. But um, oh, once I got here, it didn't take me long to realise how much opportunity there is here compared to back home. Um, you know, it's, I think if you work hard in Australia, you you get given opportunities. And I, I was pretty clear early on from my time with Gay that that was going to be the case. So Gay's was really your first taste of flat racing, but being in a big racing stable full time. Yeah. So... Um, you know, I think a lot of people think you've got to be born and bred into it and and it does take years of experience, of course, but I've actually only been working f 
you know, the first, yeah, essentially the first time I worked full time for a trainer was gay five and a half years ago. So everything's happened fairly quickly. But I think um, the eventing side of things, I think when you've got skills with horses or an interest with horses, it's really easy to transfer disciplines, as it were. Um, and, you know, with the three day eventing, they've actually got to be very fit um, at that quite high level. Um, you know, they've got to gallop for 10, 11 minutes and jump and and then they've got to trot up sound for a vet's inspection the next day and then have enough energy and precision to show jump clear. So I think, although they're not the same sport by any means, I think there's a lot of crossover and I think a lot of um, people that have done well in racing have had that equestrian background. It's just a slightly different aspect of looking at it, but you probably um, have... Yeah, a bit more of a fact. You know, I try and make sure all of my two-year-olds, for example, go correctly in a nice outline while they're trotting around and just get them to use their muscles, etc. And I'm sure I've picked up a lot of that through my initial eventing stages. But um, yeah, I haven't really been doing it for that long and haven't worked in it for that long. But um, Gay was a pretty good place to start. What um, what was the attraction to relocating to Melbourne? I did um the carnival for Gay. Um, when she she obviously has a number of horses go down to her Melbourne stable for the spring carnival, and I was lucky enough to to go down there, and um, I loved it. I loved the Flemington Carnival; it was amazing, and that's where I met Kieran Ma. Um, and I was a bit, at a little bit of a crossroads. Um, I I was sort of coming up to the end of my visa with Gay, and it was a choice of probably either asking to be sponsored or having to move on. Um. And Kieran offered me a job, and I mean, he said, "What he said, what do you want to do?" Um, he come and work for me, and I said, "Well, what's the job role?" He said, "Well, you write your job description, and I'll see if I can give you a job." So, <laughs> I wrote my own job description. I wanted to ride out. I wanted to learn how to clock horses, be in the tower on fast mornings. I wanted to go to the sales, get involved in selling horses, and yeah, he said, "Oh, I think we could probably work something out there." So. <laughs> <laughs> he was, you know, he had 80 horses in work at the time and obviously he's now probably the biggest, him and probably Chris Waller are the biggest stables numbers wise in the country. So I was lucky enough to be there when when he grew and, you know, I really did have um, exposure to every part of the business there. And I think at the time I still wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, but I think deep down I knew it was training. And when he said he was going to open a stable in Sydney, I, I said, well, can I run it, please? And he said, oh, I'm not sure if you've got enough experience. I said, well, I've just filled in for Dave Eustace while he's been at home for a month. I said, surely we did all right. He said, yeah, okay. And anyway, I eventually twisted his arm and he let me come up uh, or down. No, it is up. And, uh, <laughs> I'm confused having been up and down for the last few weeks. Um, and yeah, I suppose the rest is history. The stable grew from one horse, Dubious, winning the breeder's plate, and it grew to 50. And I spent you know two two and a half years I think running the stable up up here for him, which was an amazing experience. Yeah, I think um, from the minute you arrived, I, I was lucky enough. I, I was in Warwick Farm at the time. I think from the minute you arrived, the stable was successful, which it's actually quite hard to do um, when the headquarters are in a completely different state and you've got that second satellite stable. I think um, most people, a lot of trainers, have done it and failed. Um, but obviously we, we seen this work and it was, it was such a great, um, such a great growth period for you really. Cause you were here sort of as much as Kieran was still the trainer, but you were, you were here doing all the hard work and, um, it was such a great, um, I don't know. I, I felt like you rose very quickly in, in your own, in your own steam. Yeah. And I think what Kieran did very well when he was growing the business is he, he wanted it to be a standalone stable and not just to be seen as a satellite stable where horses are just whizzed up, raced and whizzed back down again. Um, so there was a lot of focus on buying horses just for Sydney and a lot of focus on trying to secure Sydney based clients. Um, through, through COVID, the sort of second year through COVID obviously was tricky for him to come up, but, um, yeah, I learned such um, a lot in that time because it wasn't just you know we started off with a few boxes in Gerald Ryan's and then moved out from Gerald's into the visitors boxes at Rose Hill and then it was a case of well if you want more horses go and find the boxes you know he was great <laughs> like that here and he said well, go and find them so spend hours driving around various tracks and when he'd come up we'd drive around here trying to find <laughs> empty barns and 
you know, eventually we found the stable that he's still in now. And, um, you know, it was then a case of recruiting staff, which he left to me. Um, and yeah, he, he just gave me a lot of rope, um, obviously with his guidance and support, but a lot of rope in that sense. Um, so I think that helped. That certainly helped when I've gone to set up on my own as I slightly feel, albeit I had a lot of support with Kieran, I feel like um, having done it for him, um, it's made that transition a little bit easier. What at the time when you came up to work for him, what was your role like? What what was your job description on paper? When I got here, it's sort of well, assistant trainer essentially, um, and I, I think what swayed him to let me go was I remember we came up for the Easter sales, and Lucy Yeomans, who's now his assistant at Caulfield, she was the travelling head girl, and she got kicked, fell off a horse, and got kicked at Rose Hill. She was travelling with the horses here, and she broke her leg really badly. Um, she actually hasn't really been able to ride much since actually. Um, so all of a sudden we had, you know, five or six horses at Rose Hill and nobody there to do them. So I started doing the sales and then going back and forth, you know, riding them in the mornings, going back in the afternoons. And then I said, well, who's going to Queensland with them? <laughs> so anyway, next thing, that suitcase is sent up from from uh, Melbourne to Sydney and then comes with me to Queensland. And <laughs> I didn't go back to Melbourne for what I thought was a five-day trip to to uh, the Easter Sales. Ended up being about three months away and that was with horses like Aloysia. And um, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was an unexpected um, trip, <laughs> I suppose. But it was a good, you know, I suppose it was a good stepping stone into then running a stable on my own. So at what point did you think seriously... I think I'd like to do this in, in, on my own. Yeah, I think um, I think before I'd even ask Kieran if he'd consider me to run Sydney, I think I'd already started to think that way, which is why I was so keen to to come up here and try something new. Um, I, I probably didn't envisage training so early on. I mean, I've never had a set plan, but boxes came available and um, that's hard in itself to find. And I just felt it was the right time um to just felt it was the right time to do so i thought i'd get support um and i think people are more receptive to young ambitious people out here yeah. um i think they i just feel like the australians are, are prepared to give you a go as such and obviously you've got to try and make the most of it early on because that's your time to you know it's like you're the new shiny toy i suppose and people want to give you a horse but you've got to actually come up with the goods so <laughs> we're still trying to do that now we've obviously had a good first year but um we've just got to try and keep building building on it and um you know you won't be labeled the new trainer i suppose after a few years but <laughs> at, at the time you are and everybody's sort of waiting to see how you'll get on yeah i think um i think very quickly you've cemented yourself in australian racing but you actually managed to cement yourself in one of the toughest jurisdictions that Australia's got to offer, which is Sydney Metro Racing. Did you ever think that Sydney would be the place to start or was it just that's just how the cards fell? Well, I think that's just how the cards fell. Um, but I think I've not really thought of that question before because it is just how the cards worked out. But I think it probably, you know, I think naturally I'm a, I'm a competitive person and I think I'd want to try and succeed in the most competitive environment. That's just the way I am. Um, obviously Melbourne's competitive as well, but I just get the sense that Sydney's that bit more, <laughs> that bit more competitive. I mean, the prize money's amazing and you, you know, there's a lot of uproar about it, but you see the increase in the Golden Eagle's gone up again. And it, you just think what a time to be training in Australia, <laughs> you know, in Australia, it's unbelievable the prize money on offer. And, um, yeah, I just think for someone starting out, it's just, there's no better place to be right now. You were really lucky with your, I say lucky, but it would probably have taken quite a bit of pressure off you, but your first runner was a winner. Did it feel good to get the monkey off the back, I suppose, when you're taking one to the races? Yeah, I actually said in my post race, it was good to get the monkey off my back. And <laughs> I think it was Richard Friedman or someone said, you never had the monkey on your back. It was your first runner. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. And then, he, then he, he strung two together, actually. I think our first three runners were winners. And then uh, strike went, went downhill from there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was good. I was quite confident he, he's a good horse. and um, He's actually, a tricky horse. It was commanding missile and he's, he, is, he is tricky. 
There's yeah, no he's denying little, that. He was a little bugger, actually. <laughs> he's now in Hong Kong and I'm waiting for him to boomerang back to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he was very talented. But I, there was a, you know, I was probably with Kieran for six or eight weeks after deciding to go out on my own. And obviously during with COVID and what have you and him not being able to get up here, I stayed as long as he needed me to while we were transitioning. And he's obviously got Jack Bruce now, but there was this horse that, that um, Josiah Ma, who owns Commanding Miss, I wanted to send me. And I said, well, K Kieran won't let me leave yet. <laughs> so I said, Kieran, can I just have him in the stable for now until I'm ready to go out? So um, he let me. And actually his last piece of work before Scone, he he galloped with Anders on the course proper oh, here <laughs> as Anders mate. And he worked he worked just as good. So I thought this will load up on him. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got shy and I didn't tell anyone because I was <laughs> I was too nervous with it being my first runner. But um yeah, that was a that was a big thrill actually. Yeah, I I I remember watching him because um I'm sure he won't mind me saying, but but Joseph Pride did have a have a, a small stint with him and he decided that he wasn't gonna fit in his training ranks. And I, we were both in the office watching him. And um, al although Joe did train him at the time, we were both cheering for you because it's, you know, it's a tough gig when you when you go out there because it's not like you're starting a new role, a new career, and you just, you know, you go on your way and you work hard. Everything you do is televised, so everybody's watching. And uh, we were watching, but we were we were cheering you on that day because, and even you can ask Joe, he, he was we had him for a bit, and he was a bit of a tough war, so. Um, it made it a little bit more rewarding for us to see you do that. <laughs> yeah, he was he was cheeky. I remember speaking to Joe about it and he said, good riddance, you're welcome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he was a bit naughty. Um, so, I mean, you, you've sort of, you, you've cemented yourself at Warwick Farm. You, you're, you're getting horses in. But I think one thing that, that I really liked about what you were doing was you were building a team. You know, you weren't just a one-man band, which sometimes... In racing, we can see trainers are, are so good at training horses and, and the office running the business side because we care so much about the horses and the welfare. It can sort of get a little bit left behind, but I felt like you'd done it differently in the sense that you'd gone out there and what it looked like from the outside was you were handpicking um, a, a young, successful team to help you build this. So how important is that team that you have around you? Oh, massively so. And, you know, it's it's in some ways it's a shame because – you're the name on the ticket, but you're such a small, you know, I'm such a small part of our operation, really, um, or one of a number of important people. So it's very much a team, even though it's, it's my name on the license. There's so many people behind that that get probably as big a thrill as I do out of, out of the wins that we get. Um, but it's so important. And there's a lot more demand probably on, on trainers' time now with, you know, I suppose trying to it's competitive to get owners so you want to always give them an edge and it's you know the communication is so important but all of that with that comes a lot of time um and there are days where I feel like I'm spending more time having to do videos and write emails than I are than I am actually training their horse okay <laughs> and it can feel like that sometimes um so I think it's important that you've got a good team around you that can actually let you concentrate on what you're good at and what you want to do and for me I just I want to really be able to concentrate on the horses you've obviously got to give your and I enjoy giving clients time as well um, but there's lots of other things that, that can be shared and delegated and I think um, you know I'm absolutely awful at admin horrendous <laughs> personal admin and business admin anything computer wise that needs doing I've got loads of speeding tickets that haven't been paid for. <laughs> All of that, I'm I'm just a complete disaster. So I've identified that, and I've got you know a couple of great girls, Alex and Talia, um, that deal with all of that stuff for me because you, your brain becomes frazzled trying to mind does trying to worry about when's the car's MOT due <laughs> or whatever it may be. So I need someone to, con to concentrate on that for me so that I can concentrate on the horses and. Um, yeah, I've built up a great team. Um, and you know, all these horses, they're, they're valuable and they're important to, to their owners and to us. So you've got to, they've got to be well looked after as well. So it's not just the, you know, administration and the, and the, um, assistant trainers, um, that are important. It's, it's from the bottom up. It's from your, you know, your stable hands here at Warwick Farm. We've got to lead them down the roads and, you know, it's important to have those skilled people, you know, right from the stable hands through to, to people in the office and 
Um, I place great emphasis on that and I'm always looking for good staff, anyone good that wants to come, even if we don't quite need them, you just try and do the numbers. Can we take you on? Because, <laughs> you know, desperate to have them. And yeah, I think um, we've built up a really big, uh, really good team and um, we'll continue hopefully to to build. Would you Would you like to be known for that as someone that takes on that? You know, the, the, maybe those sort of greener staff and, and mold them into a strong team. Would you would you like to be known for that? Yeah, I enjoy that. Um, like I've taken a couple of girls out of school that liked ponies and horses but had never worked in the industry. And one girl, Julia, works for me and she, you know, she was very green. She started with me right from the start and she'd be, I think her dad used to bring her before school. You know, she's now finished school and she's working for us full time, but she's second in charge of one of the barns now. And she's, you know, she's loving it and doing well. And, you know, one of my track work riders hadn't ever, hadn't ridden before. And, um, you know, he can now go out on the course proper and gallop one and be <laughs> spot on with his times. And I get a, you know, quite a good kick out of that. <laughs> um, we're actually just about to have um, Ellen Hennessy come on loan to us, um, okay. apprentice. And I just, I think, I, yeah, I do enjoy that. And I don't think there's enough of it. I think what Lindy Morris is doing is amazing. And I think she needs or should have more support. Yep. Because I think that is our biggest downfall in, yep. in Australia is the lack of education. Um, you've got the British Racing School back home, which probably feeds quite a lot of of staff and uh, but I think here particularly as we're training in cities a lot of those really good horsemen they don't want to live in the city they're probably there's probably loads of good people living out in the bush that yeah. would never want <laughs> to live here so a lot of the people that we need working for us are going to have to be happy living in Warwick Farm um, so I think we need to find those people that already live in the city that we can train up yeah um but it's not a quick fix. It, you know, it takes time and it takes effort. And for me, I'm happy to take those green people on because I've got probably good and good senior staff that can help them. Look after them. You were only nine months in and you trained your first group one winner. Was that a bit surreal? Yeah, very. Um, <laughs> I remember it was relief as well. It, it was a strange build up. He was favourite and then it got cooled off with the rain and it was then they redrew the barriers and I didn't think we drew as well. And it was a fair bit of pressure. He I'd inherited him um from Chris Waller. Um and, you know, he was looking like a really promising horse. So I felt there was a fair bit of pressure to deliver a group one with him because he looked like a group one <laughs> winner in the making. So it was, I think, it was a strange feeling of, of relief more than anything else initially. And then just that feeling of, gee, I'm a group one winning trainer now. And <laughs> yeah, it's quite strange. <laughs> I, I just think like, what a feat. As, as we spoke about, this jurisdiction is so tough. And you're up against super stables who have, who've got numbers, who've got, who've got the owners, who've got the, the caliber of horses in there. And I think to be able to come and do that in your first nine months, running your own ship I, I think it's so commendable I think it's really, I think you've probably provided a lot of inspiration for a lot of people actually <laughs> well I hope so but I think as well it's important um, you've sort of got to put the blinkers on um, because it can be a bit daunting otherwise um, and I think it's it's easy to be influenced by other people and you know obviously now there's social media and everything so many opinions are aired Um they're doing this wrong. She's doing that wrong. Why is she doing that? <laughs> and I think it's important to basically ignore all that and just. I'm all. I was still asked advice off people that I respect. That were, that and people are you know other trainers in particular have been really welcoming, yep. um, in asking advice. And you know I am still young, and I suppose green would be the right word. Um, but I think you've got to have self belief. And you, it's yeah, it is a bit of a shark tank out there. You've got to block a lot of it out and just look forward at what you're doing and have belief in what you're doing. Because the minute you start worrying about what everyone else thinks and what everyone else is doing, I think is when you take your eye off the ball. Um, so yeah, for me, that's been I think the biggest lesson, and I decided I'd be like that from day one. Is just be your own person, do your own thing. Um, I didn't go out on my own. For no reason, I went out on my own training because I thought I was ready to do it. And 
yeah, I just think for anyone else starting out, I'd say, you know, that's the one thing you've got to do is just row your own ship. You've had quite a bit of luck buying from overseas and importing these horses in. So we can't not talk about him because he's, he's the be all and end all. But how did we go about buying Zaki? Um, I wanted to buy, so it was obviously this time last year, and I wanted to buy one horse. I had a group of guys came to me and said they'd like to buy half a horse. Um, so I thought, well, I have to somehow find the other half. <laughs> um, so I spoke to Stuart Bowman, who I built up a pretty good relationship with working when I was working for Kieran. And um, he sent me a list and a lot of them were just making so much money. And uh, we had a budget of £150,000. And he put this horse on the on the list, Zaki, who's five-year-old, ran poorly his last couple of starts. But he said to me, I've been trying to buy this horse forever. And he said, I'm so happy to see it in the in the catalogue. Um, he's got a reserve of 300 on. So, But he said, let's just follow it through. Anyway, he passed in. So Stuart credit to him, somehow managed to go and buy the horse for half of its reserve. And obviously the rest is history, but I think um, a couple of other people, one of, I won't name who, but one of one of my friends he said, well, have you bought that horse? It needs to come with a Zimmer frame. <laughs> you trained I, it out of I it remind him of that a lot. Um, <laughs> but I think sometimes you've got to think outside the box with those horses a bit. He'd only had 20 starts for a five year old. It's not, you know, he hadn't been ran into the ground. He was trained by Sir Michael Stout, who's a great trainer. And, you know, you know, you're buying a horse that would have been well looked after. Um, so Stuart said to me, the one thing he said, even if he's no good, Annabelle, you'll, you'll enjoy looking at him every day. He's a beautiful animal. And he's right. Like, he's just <laughs> gorgeous horse. Um, did I expect him to have won me three group ones 12 months later? Probably not. No. Um, but we did. I did. My sales pitch was that we could maybe get him to a Doncaster, but the Doombin Cup would probably be his race. <laughs> and you know from when you were probably doing sales for Joe, those sales pitches don't normally materialise to what the plan is, but somehow it, it paid off and, and more. And more, and more. What, what is he like in the stable? Um, he's got a, he's, he's quite arrogant, actually. He's got a, <laughs> he's nice. He is, he's nice, but he knows he's good. And I've noticed, I noticed a change in his demeanour after he started being put on a pedestal. <laughs> I don't know if I just hadn't noticed it before and I'm imagining it, but I, he does walk around the place like he owns it. And But under saddle, he's always had so much presence. He was pretty hairy when we first got him and he took a while to to shed that coat. But that first trial we took him to, that was probably the day I thought we. he was so much more forward than I thought he was in condition. I thought we've probably got a proper one here. <laughs> it's, it's a subject that I, I don't, I, I don't know, I tune and fro with it a lot, but I think it's important that our industry talk about it. You've came from eventing, from from loving a pony that was in your village to training group one winners. It's such, it's such a horrible th- notion when you hear people talk about our, our industry with, with the hangover of welfare over it. What, what is your take on welfare in the industry? Well, I think on the whole from... From the places I've worked, and I've you know been fortunate, I've only worked in good stables, but they're treated, and my horses, they're treated like kings and queens. You know, they want for nothing. Um, you know, they they get the best of care. But obviously, you know, the the video that came to light last year, I think it was with those horses that end up in the abattoir. Um, you know, it probably did highlight the need for something to change. And I think there's so many horses, there would be so many horses that aren't good enough. And where do they all end up? Um, you know, we we do, some of our prize money goes towards welfare. And there's obviously, a, um, Peter Rolandes has, has got that um, farm for, for horses to go and retire to. But um, I think there's always more that can be done. I think that owners should probably put in money when they buy into a horse that will enable there to be a little fund to retrain it, to go and do another job. Not all horses will be suitable to do that. But I think on the whole, horses are looked after superbly. But there's definitely, you know, 
there are horses that probably fall through the cracks and I think it needs to be monitored and not just swept under the carpet. Now, a little birdie told me that you might be training for a marathon next year. <laughs> mm. I trained for one this year and they kept getting cancelled. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Would you continue that on? Would you be able to train yourself as well as your team of horses? Funnily enough, I, I when I was training for it, um, I ended up running six half marathons in a row at the weekends during lockdown. It was sort of July time and I think 30 k 29k was about the f- furthest I went but I felt so much better in the day like sharper I get tired as do all people in our industry when you wake up at three o'clock every day I, I do struggle with just being tired particularly driving to and from the stables you know I'm half asleep but when I was really fit I just found I was so much more productive yeah okay um got a little bit of an injury knee injury so I had to back off and, you know, the carnival's just been so busy. I ha- I've sort of lost time, but today is the day that I'm restarting and I am going to run a marathon in about four months' time. I four months. Uh, where is it? Sydney? Yeah, I think there's one in Orange. I was trying okay. to find one, maybe Orange, but or it might get, get pushed back to the Gold Coast again in June. But we'll just see how we go. I'm not going to put a – just see how <laughs> I get myself in pre-training and see how I go. <laughs> um, I think y- your career – so far has been has been so good and well and I'm so excited to see what it is you continue to do for yourself but for the industry how you know I for me I feel like training the, those horses of that caliber you've got high profile owners in there you've got a fantastic young team what is the pressures that come with that I think um obviously when people are putting trust into you and therefore money you know expensive cults etc your way there is a pressure to deliver because your results depend on their return of investment um but i'm fortunate that you know the the professional owners as it were um the cults with the cults you know the stud farms etc you know they're all pretty understanding and they know you know, they're actually nearly the easier guys to train for because they understand that there are a lot of a lot of disappointments um, with horses. Um, but yeah, there is pressure, and but I like a certain element of pressure. But I think I feel it less than I thought I was going to. Um, and I think you have to have a reality check and you know put everything into perspective every now and then. I do remember when I was working for Kieran, and, and it was the year he had about six in the slipper. And that I was, I was like a pressure cooker leading into the (laughs) slipper. I was just absolutely desperate to get all the ones we thought would get in, in, and they had to win certain races. And I remember Kieran pulled me aside and he said, you're going to explode. He said, you can't live life like this. It's just a whole, you know, he put, he said, look, if they don't win, they don't win. Like you've done everything you can. And that was a bit of a reality check and I've never forgotten that. Um, So yeah. I do feel the pressure, I'm not going to lie, but at the end of the day, if you're doing everything to the best of your ability and you're trying to leave no stone unturned, then that's the best you can do. Yeah. What um what's the plan? What's what do we have as you said you've never really had a grand plan, but what would you like to see for Annabelle Nisham in the next 12 months? I think um I'd like to obviously continue trying to win group ones. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully with, you know, horses not just Zaki and Moanga, but other new horses on the scene. Um and just consolidate what we've done so far. I you know, I obviously, you know, everybody likes to grow at this stage. I'm not looking at becoming huge because I'm pretty hands on. Um, but I'd like to try and, you know, I suppose short term goals. I'd love to get one of the two year olds into the slipper and um, but I haven't got any specific targets as such. Um, but yeah, I think the main thing is just trying to do I'm sure it's everybody says it, but trying to, you know, get the best out of each individual horse. And I think that is that is all you can do. You've um your your client base is is, is quite a few heavy hitters, but you do go and you buy a lot of horses that sell specifically for yourself to put new people into. What sort of syndicates? I know you have a lady syndicate. Yeah, we've got the stiletto sprinters, as we call them, <laughs> uh, which is a great bunch. A lot of my friends, a lot of my friends' mums, a lot of new um, clients. I think there's about, there's probably nearly 100 women. <laughs> um, we bought two horses. Um, 
one of which is back in the stable. We're hoping to get to the Magic Millions and the other filly's just about to come back in. But that's just mainly been about, you know, having fun. Obviously, we want to have success as well, but we've got a fair few events planned with them. And um, I've got a syndicate as well with Lizzie Jelfs. That's another girl's syndicate. So I've enjoyed doing those. But I like a massive part of training is is for me is selecting horses you know some trainers don't like doing it and they just use an agent but I love going around the sales and trying to identify horses I like and you know I, Bohemian Daisy ran third in the Ottawa Stakes last week um, she was a hellbent filly I bought from this complex here at, at the classic sale and I just loved her and you just get that extra bit of thrill <laughs> out of one that you've selected yourself um, and yeah I think it's good as well to have um, I suppose a shop window is, is probably the only way I can think of explaining it. You know, when you've got clients wanting to come and um, buy a horse with you, if you haven't got anything to offer, you're going to look. You know, you're going to lose that potential client. So, I think you don't want to overexpose yourself, but I think it's important to buy horses yourself um, in order to market them to new owners that want to get involved in the sport. Will we ever see you back in the eventing ring at all? Have you got a horse I can borrow? <laughs> I've got plenty. I've got I'll have plenty. a go on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just, you know, I think your skills from, as you said, are so transferable. And I think it's, um, I think as Pony Club and eventing give you a wonderful foundation to actually turn that into not only a business, but a lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think I'd love to definitely see you back out there. And um, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind doing that. When I go home, I go and of jump mum's horses give her give it a yeehaw around all the hedges and <laughs> such a buzz but you, you your eye gets out I'll probably end up going on flyers or burying them on deep strides but um yeah I, I go and ride Kathy O'Hara's horses every now and then and I've had the odd jumping lesson um on her horses which you know is gives me a good fix for a few months but um yeah I, I, I'm too busy to say I miss it but now you've said it, I wouldn't mind actually having a burn around a cross-country course. <laughs> well, there's plenty of hunter trials going up and around, so there's plenty of horses for you to have a go on. But Annabelle, thank you so much for for chatting with us. I, I really loved just getting to go back to, to find, because, you know, when we see you in the media, we're mostly talking about the horses and winning group one. So it's been it's been really enjoyable to hear where it started. And I'm so excited to see where it's going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was super. That was all right. That was excellent. That was really good. I'm so Did pleased. I get your mind? <laughs>